أنتم تستمعون إلى الديوانية. نخي مازنين لديوانية. ديوانية يدنا مكتسنس. أتم أكشيبيم لي ديوانية. ديوانية يدنا مكتسنس. أنتم تستمعون إلى ديوانية. From the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University, you're listening to ديوانية. I am like a royal falcon for whom the wide arena of the world, for all its breadth, is too narrow for flight. Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. A philosopher, an agitator, and one of the earliest Islamic anti-imperialists, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani's wandering existence brought him in contact with Ottoman sultans, Persian shahs, French historians, and future assassins. Martin Kramer, director of the Shalem Center in Jerusalem, a fellow at the Washington Institute of Near East Policy, and the former director of the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University, joins Diwaniya today to talk about the life and legacy of Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. This is Ben Silsby for Diwaniya. I'm joined today by Martin Kramer. Martin, could you give us a little bit of background about the world in which Afghani lived? It was a time of imperialism throughout the Muslim lands. Well, it was a time of growing expansion of European power in Muslim lands. Afghani was born in 1838 or 1839, and in the course of the next 60, 70 years, we saw the mutiny in India against British rule. We saw the um, occupation of Egypt, and we saw the growing tentacles which were being extended uh, by uh, European powers into the Muslim East. So Fahani lived in, at the apex of Western imperialism in the Muslim world. His career follows more or less the same trajectory as that expansion. And so I think that you know, when I was a student in the 70s, there was much still being said about him. I think with the rise of um, various forms of Islamism, a different lineage of ideas has uh, taken hold. And so uh, while Afghani is revered in, in, in Afghanistan and seen as a kind of precursor to the Islamic revolution in Iran, I think his, his legacy has faded somewhat in the Arab world. What is his ideal Islamic state? Well, he didn't present an ideal Islamic state. The, the key contribution that he made was this idea that Islam requires resistance to imperialism. In other words, Muslims must rule themselves. So it was particularly, the message was particularly attuned to a period when Muslims were ruled by others. And that's when his posthumous reputation developed and was cultivated. It's less relevant at a time such as today when Muslims do rule themselves, and the question is not a subordination to imperial rule or resistance to imperial rule, but the question is how Muslims order their own affairs. And on this, he didn't have a lot to say. As I said, he was not a vocal advocate of constitutional rule. The constitutional revolutions followed him. They were not part of his legacy. There are other heroes of those movements. I think his message, to, to the extent that it survives, is that Islam is under attack from the West and there needs to be resistance to it. But I think it comes across today in a much more effective form in the message of Said Qutb, the idea of crusaderism, the, the, the teachings of Khomeini. So um, I'd say that his message was suited to a specific period of time when Muslims were under the direct boot of European imperialism. Where is his origin? Well, Afghani's name is, um, is deceptive because it gives the impression that he was indeed an Afghan. He used the name Afghani when he was traveling in the Sunni parts of the Islamic world because he himself was actually born in Iran, in Persia, a Shiite Muslim in a village called Asadabad near Hamadan in Iran. And uh, when he was, in fact, in Afghanistan, he did not call himself Afghani. He called himself Istanbuli or Rumi, which would have been Anatolian. This was part of his persona. In order to have his messages and ideas accepted in the Sunni Muslim world, at that time, he would have had to have been perceived to be Sunni, not Shia. And so he actually began in Iran. He had a Shiite schooling. He studied in the Shiite holy cities in Iraq. And only later, and particularly when he arrived in Egypt, did he systematically call himself Afghani. Give us an idea of his career trajectory. Where do his travels take him? He travels to Iraq in the Ottoman Empire, to the Shiite holy cities, where he studies. After that, he, um, he visits India. He's in India at the time of the Indian mutiny. It's from that period that his animosity towards British imperialism and rule can be dated. He then makes an appearance in Afghanistan. Now, we don't have a clear chronology of his movements before that. He arrives in Afghanistan. He takes sides in a quarrel over the succession to... Um, and it's a rulership there. At first he has the upper hand, then he has the lower hand, and he leaves. Uh, by 1871, he finds himself in Egypt. This is where he has his greatest impact, and he's there from 1871 to 1879. He is expelled for agitating. Uh, this was his want. Uh, he finds himself later in... Um, actually, I, I skipped a, a, a... Say he was in Istanbul for a very, very brief period before he came to Egypt. 
He winds up in Iran. He winds up in Paris, where he publishes his famous journal, Ur al Wifka, with Muhammad Abdu. He is uh, again in Iran, where he is feted and then expelled. He finishes his career in, uh, in Istanbul, where he dies of, of cancer of the jaw. He, he travels around quite a bit, and the same pattern recurs again and again. He seeks influence through a patron. He agitates against the ruler of the time for his collusion with the British and finds himself expelled. And it's a pattern that recurs again and again. Why is this? So you, you said he, was, he found his anti-imperialism during his time in India during the mutiny, mm. and he carries this with him from, from place to place. Was he exclusively anti-British, or did this apply to other imperial powers as well? Well, Britain, of course, was the power which most in, intruded upon the Islamic world at that time. He, at various times, actually appeared as a, as a Russian agent and at one juncture was trying to incite the Russians to wage war against the British. Obviously, the French gave him, uh, allowed him uh, leeway to operate in Paris in his anti-British activism. So um, most of his anti-imperial message was directed against uh, Britain. And, of course, at its pinnacle when he was in Egypt between 1871 and 1879, this was the period leading up to the British occupation of Egypt. The British were already, by various means of um, uh, pressure on the Khedive Ismail, ratcheting up uh, their role in, um, in Egypt. It has to be remembered that it's from his time in Egypt that his reputation, that is from which his reputation stems. Because his primary student, Muhammad Abdu, an Egyptian cleric, became his adoring disciple uh, and wrote a, effectively the biography of uh, Afafani, which... Um, which would become the foundation stone of all subsequent writing about him. What were the elements of his teachings? It's interesting that if you read Afghani's various students, some will tell you that, that he was very religious, and others will tell you that he was very irreligious. And Eli Kadori, in his famous biography, called this, he subtitled it, A Study in Political Activism and Religious Unbelief. And what is it that left such differing impressions on uh, Afghani's various interlocutors? We had this notion that a very simple message should be purveyed to the masses and a more esoteric message to the elites. And the more esoteric message was very rational, questioning of religious dogma. And it's because of some slippage in various presentations that he made in different countries, for instance, when he was in Istanbul, that he was regarded as a heretic. But among the masses, he preached a very straightforward message of fealty to Islam, and the notion that this required resistance to imperialism. And so he was, I would say, broadcasting on several different uh, wavelengths simultaneously in his message. In Egypt, there, were, there was uh, an esoteric message among the close circle of people to whom he was affiliated and a broader political message. And the political message was, was quite clear. You know, the Khedib Ismail was betraying the Egyptian nation by subordinating himself to the British. He actually cast his lot with Taufik, who succeeded Khedib Ismail, but uh, Taufik had no use for him either and eventually mm. would bring about his expulsion. The important thing here is that he did not preach constitutional rule. There are a few instances where here or there where he makes allusion to it, but it wasn't the most consistent part of his preaching. How was Afghani able to reconcile using the more advanced discourse for Europeans while using a more simple one on his fellow Muslims? Well, Afghani had no difficulty in developing what I would call multiple discourses for different audiences, depending on the circumstance. Uh, I'll give you an example of it. Afghani is known as a pan-Islamic theorist. He only became a pan-Islamic theorist in Paris uh, when he published Or al Wuthka in the early 1880s. When he was in India, he preached a message of nationalism, uh, Indian nationalism, Hindu-Muslim unity. And when he was in Egypt, he also preached a nationalist message. He was always preaching the message which he thought would most mobilize people against imperialism. And pan-Islam, when it became fashionable in the Ottoman Empire under the Sultan Abdul Hamid, suddenly had an appeal as well. So he switched gears and began to preach the pan-Islamic message. The double discourse was just another reflection of his double identity as a Shiite when it was when he was in Iran and as a Sunni when he was in the Muslim in the Sunni Muslim world and he had also um, a double discourse when it came to the use of uh, violence sometimes he would preach reform and other times he would openly advocate violence and in fact uh, this would come to fruition in more than one assassination plot uh, later what was his view of violence uh, you said that it changed but he's uh, he's later implicated in the murder of Shah Nasr al-Din how does this come about well, Afghani, as I said, he was never um, a clear advocate of say, parliamentary government or constitutional rule. He believed that an enlightened despot as opposed to a benighted despot would do the right thing. And therefore, he, but he developed this notion that tyranny had to be resisted, and it could even be resisted by violence. On one occasion, 
Abdu said that Afghani, and I quote Abdu here, proposed to me that the Khedib Ismail should be assassinated someday as he passed in his carriage daily over the Qasr Nile Bridge, and I strongly approved, Abdu says, which casts some question mark about Abdu's uh, commitment. And he did inspire a disciple by the name of Mirza to assassinate Shah Nasr Din. He had been a servant of uh, Afghani when he was in Iran, and then he came to visit Afghani in Istanbul, and Afghani incited him to go back to Iran, where he assassinated the Shah. Afghani said, and I quote him as, uh, on, on this, Surely it was a good deed to kill this bloodthirsty tyrant, this Nero on the Persian throne, who nonetheless knew how to throw sand in the eyes of civilized Europe so that it did not recognize his deeds. It was well done then to kill him, for it may be a warning to others. This is the first time that a Shah has found his death, not in a palace revolution, but at the hands of an ordinary man, and thus for a tyrant to receive just recompense for his deeds, end of quote. So Afghani actually has a place of some distinction in the history of assassination in the Middle East. The idea that the ordinary man, the ordinary man could take things into his own hands and kill the tyrant came, of course, um, something which would characterize everything from the thinking from everywhere from the Muslim Brotherhood to the Ba'ath Party. It would be, I think, mistaken to believe that Afghani only believed or believed at all and changed through a strictly peaceful means, quite the opposite. How has his legacy come down to us? Well, the Hiri, of course, his partnership with Muhammad Abdu is very important in Egypt, and there were others as well. He, he was an inspirational figure, almost a cult-like figure, especially during his time in Egypt. Um, and they basically translated his views into an acceptable language, and, ex- and Afghani himself was not someone who wrote a great deal. Most of what we have from Afghani are lectures or talks which he delivered, which his followers transcribed. And one imagines that in the process of that transcription, these ideas also took on a, let us say, more acceptable form for a Sunni listener. So what would you say is Afghani's legacy? How has he influenced modern-day Islamist parties and Muslim religious figures? Well, Afghani, it's important to remember, was fairly obscure in his time. That's why it's so difficult to, to reconstitute his movements. If he was someone who had, was always in the public limelight, it would have been much easier to do the work that subsequent historians did. And in fact, we only got a very a clear picture of the, the real Afghani in the 1960s when a cache of papers, which he had left in Iran on his expulsion from there in 1891, finally surfaced and was published. So his reputation is posthumous, and that's important to know. I mean, the average person in the 19th century Islamic world did not know who Jamal al-Din al-Afghani was. He became, I think, famous through the work of his disciples, who did write and did publish and did have journals and um, who turned him into a kind of a precursor of many of their own ideas, as a legitimizer of many of their own ideas. It is interesting, and I, and I took an actually close look at this myself, of how this posthumous reputation builds in Afghanistan. He was completely forgotten there because he wasn't an Afghan. And then in... Um, in the second decade of the 20th century, some people rediscover his legacy, and suddenly here's this Afghan figure who they then lionize. And Afghani was buried in Istanbul when he died. And by, in 1944, the Afghans actually succeeded in having his body exhumed in Istanbul and transferred to Afghanistan, uh, where he is buried in the University of Kabul. Uh, we don't even know if it's really his body because the grave was marked in a questionable way. And in any case, he wasn't an Afghan. But there he has served as a kind of a symbol for above all the petty differences within Afghanistan, and no surprise because he belonged to none of of the ethnic groups or tribes of Afghanistan. But he also has a reputation in Iran. He is from Iran. And you find him the subject of a postage stamp, and streets are named after him in Iran. His legacy lives on in the Arab world through some of his writings. I think that in recent years, less so probably. Uh, Now you hear much more of the formative influence of people like Said Qutb for Islamists. The reformists don't have a champion really, and Afghani would not be a good selection. Are there any books or articles you'd recommend for our listeners who want to find out more? I think most students probably encounter Afghani in a general text, Albert Harani's Arabic Thought in the Liberal Age. He was not an Arab, and his thought was not Arabic, but um, he figures prominently there precisely because of the influence he subsequently had. Um, And whether his thought was liberal, I think, as I've indicated, is a very open question. But that's far from being the sum of it. There are two other works in English, which are must-reading, uh, one is Eli Kadori's very short book, about 100 pages, on Afghani and Abdu, in which he dwells a great deal on Afghani's double discourse and uh, brings a great deal of evidence for uh, heterodox nature of some of his ideas. But then I think even more importantly is Nikki Keddie's masterful 
biography of Afghani, which makes full use of the later documentation which surfaced, in especially Afghani's papers, but also um, the intelligence reports of various foreign governments. And there you will get, I think, a definitive statement of, of Afghani's travels, ideas, political activism. It's actually quite riveting. Uh, those are the best sources. They're sources in other languages. Uh, most of what was written uh, before these works on Afghani is unreliable. Thank you for listening to Diwaniya, Conversations on Middle East Culture, History, and Politics. Diwaniya is produced by Alona Ferber, Shoshi Shmulevitz, and Ben Silsby. For more information on the topic of today's show and our guests, please visit the Diwaniya blog at www.diwaniya.blogspot.com. Diwaniya is made possible through the support of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies at Tel Aviv University. This episode of Diwaniya was recorded on January 18, 2012 at Tel Aviv University.